Hello students, welcome to MEC 1321 Engineering Statics. Today we're going to start a new chapter which is chapter 4, Force System Resultants. Um, with the start of each chapter there's a chapter objectives, there's a, a number of things that we're going to cover uh, within this chapter. Um, we're going to discuss the concept of the moment of a force and show how to calculate it in two and three dimensions. We're going to provide a method for finding the moment of a force about a specified axis. We're going to define the moment of a couple. We're going to present methods for determining the resultants of non-concurrent force systems and indicate how to reduce a simply distributed load to a resultant force at a specific location. Now I know all of that sounds like a lot of jargon, but we're going to go section by section and meet all of those objectives. So section 4.1 is moment of a force scalar. So we're going to determine what a moment is uh, and how to calculate it in, 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 2D, in two dimensions. A moment is the tendency of a force to rotate an object about a point that is not on the line of action of the force. It is sometimes called torque. Uh, a, a moment is also denoted by a, a capital M. And a classic example of what a moment is and how do we perceive a moment is the wrench and bolt. So say you have a wrench uh, and you apply it to a bolt and your hand puts a force at the end of that wrench. That force uh, that is applied perpendicular to the distance from the, from the point of interest which is point O, which is the center of that bolt, uh, creates a moment, a tendency of rotation about point O. Uh, and from that, if we take that analogy of the, the hand, the wrench, and the bolt, we can you know, create a, a diagram that, uh, a diagram version uh, of, of that problem. And so if we look, you know, we look at the, the hand, the wrench, the bolt, if we were to idealize it, we will have this point O, which is the point of interest. Um, about point O, there is a moment that develops. There is some distance from point O to where the force is applied, and, and that distance, D0, uh, uh, is a distance that is perpendicular to the line of action of a force F. Okay? So, um, you know, that's what a moment is. A moment is a tendency of a force to cause rotation uh, uh, of an object about some point. So how do we calculate the magnitude of a moment? So for instance, how do we calculate the magnitude of the moment that's occurring uh, at point O from this wrench bolt system? Well, the magnitude of a moment about point O is equal to that force times the moment arm, which is D0. And that moment arm is the perpendicular distance from point O to the line of action of the force. Okay, and a mag uh, the the magnitude of a moment, or the 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 magnitude of the moment, has certain units. If we were to look at what a moment is, it's force times distance. We know that force is in a certain unit, and distance is in a certain unit. So the units for a moment are either newton meters or pounds feet. And it can be different combinations. So it could be newton millimeters or uh, pound inches, uh, but it's, it's a unit of force times a unit of length. Now let's consider a planar force vector. So say we have, instead of your wrist is perfectly perpendicular to the wrench, say your wrist is twisted a little bit and it's going in a, an awkward direction away from that wrench. If we were to consider that and idealize it, we would have a diagram similar to the one that we see here, where at point O there is some moment that develops. There's some distance D0 uh, to the line of action of that force FR. And if we were to take that force FR, we could simplify it, or we, we could um, take that, that force, call it a resultant force, um, and break it down into components along the x and along the y axes. If we are to take that force vector and break it into components fx and fy, we should notice certain things. If we were to look at this assembly, point O, 
there's supposed to be some moment that develops. And we look at force uh, Fx, by just simply I, just looking at the problem, we can see that if we were to just consider force Fx, force Fx does not produce any rotation. It's something that is in line, the, the line of action of force X goes through point O, and so there's no moment that would be uh, generated uh, from force X. So if we were to consider this resultant force, only the Y component will contribute to the moment that develops about point O. And that's because that's Y, y component is perpendicular. And if you know, we are applying that perpendicular force, uh, well, if we're applying that force and there's some perpendicular distance, then we create a sense of rotation and we create a moment. So that's you know, the basic concept of what a moment is. Now, the important thing is how do we decide what is a positive sense of, of rotation uh, for moments? So if we're creating these moments, we're going clockwise or counterclockwise or what have you, uh, what is a positive sense of rotation? Well, in previous sections, we talked about the right hand rule and, and how by using our right hand and creating a certain structure in it, we can identify the positive x, y, and z axes, and we can use that, and we can use that to be consistent. Well, by simply curling our fingers in the right hand rule, we can identify what would be a positive sense of rotation if we're using a right hand coordinate system. And that positive sense of rotation is going to be counterclockwise. So general, generally, we consider positive moments as counterclockwise and negative moments as clockwise. And this is unless it's stated otherwise. So in some problems in the book, some examples, um, you'll see that uh, there's an assumption made initially that clockwise is positive. Uh, however, a majority of the time in your homework and ex especially on the exams, you should assume right-hand rule and you should assume that counterclockwise is positive. Let's move to the next slide. So, you know, now that we've described what a moment is, we've described how you can break down a, a force a vector into components and that certain components will create a, a sense of rotation or contribute to the moment, certain point, uh, points won't, let's think about a resultant moment. So let's think uh, if we have a system of forces, in this case, a force vector one, force vector two, force vector three, and they're all, uh, they all have their own line of actions, and we're trying to find the resultant moment of these forces at some point O. Uh, well, again, we're going to use the right-hand rule. We're going to assume that counterclockwise is positive and that clockwise is negative. And we can use the things that we've learned in the past where we can simply, if we want to find the resultant of some quantity, we can simply sum it up. So in this case, the resultant moment about point O is going to be equal to the sum of the force vectors times the moment arm, which is a perpendicular distance. Uh, and when we perform this calculation for the uh, figure that we have here on our left, we'll find that the resultant moment about point O is equal to uh, the uh, F1 times D1 minus F2 times D2 plus F3 times D3, where we're using our, our sense, our, our counterclockwise sense as positive and clockwise as our negative sense. Um, and notice how in this resultant we have our force and we have the moment arm, which is a perpendicular distance um, from point O to the line of action of the force vector. So in this case, we can simply take the magnitude of the force vector and that moment arm or the perpendicular distance from point O to the line of action of these forces. Uh, and that's very key to, to remember. That is that we can use very, we can simply use the, uh, the moment arm, the perpendicular distance, uh, to find the, uh, the, the moment of a force vector which it can have any kind of orientation. Um, but there's a couple of uh, other tricky things that we will see later on. So now that we've 
learned about what a moment is. We've played around with it a little bit. Uh, let's go back into mathematics and, and look at a, a special uh, 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 multiplication that we can use that will be helpful uh, when dealing with 3D moments. Uh, section 4.2 is cross product. A cross product is a useful approach to find the vector which is perpendicular to a plane formed of two vectors. So let's look at the diagram that we have to our right here. Say we have some, vec some vector A and some vector B. And they create, they create a plane, which is the yellow plane that we see outlined here. And let's say that we would like to find some vector that is perpendicular to the surface of this plane AB. And that vector would be C. That vector C would have a unit direction vector UC. Uh, and it would be perpendicular, so 90 degrees to the surface of this plane AB. The cross product will allow us to find that perpendicular uh, vector C. Uh, the cross product is simply C is equal to, uh, the C vector is equal to the A vector cross the B vector. The magnitude of that perpendicular plane can be found to be equal to C is equal to magnitude A times magnitude B times sine of theta, where theta is the angle that is in between vectors A and vectors B. So it's the angle between those two vectors. Uh, we can also uh, determine the, uh, the direction of the unit vector. Uh, um, uh, the directional information, meaning the unit direction vector, uh, using the following equation. Uh, the vector C is equal to the magnitude A times the magnitude B times sine of theta times the unit dire direction vector of vector C. Uh, and so this simply shows how we can go from just the magnitude to the actual Cartesian vector form of vector C using its unit direction vector. U, C. Okay. So an interesting or an important uh, feature of the cross product is its laws of operations. Um, with a cross product, uh, one of the laws or the, the most important that we should notice is that it's not a commutative law, meaning that if we have a vector A cross vector B, that it's, it's that if we were to switch the positions and we wanted to have B cross A, if we wanted both sides to be equal, then it would have to be negative B vector cross A. And so uh, this is a very important feature because it means that if we're going to use this uh, cross product, that we have to be very careful in which vector we identify as a first vector and which we identify as a second. Uh, the reason for this uh, non-commutative property is the way that uh, the cross product is performed. So say we have A cross B. Well if we're doing A cross B, we're doing A cross B, then we can assume that we have a positive uh, C uh, vector uh, which is produced. However if we're doing B cross A, we're assuming from B cross over to A, then it'll pro it will produce a negative C vector. Uh, and so this is something important to take into consideration because it also can lead to you producing uh, 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 inaccurate senses of direction uh, for, for quantity C. And then of course there are these other uh, uh, rules that are important. There's a scalar multiplication rule which is tra fairly straightforward and we don't have to worry too much about it. And the distributive law which again we're not going to have to worry too much about uh, when we're using it in this class. So now that we've done that, how do we actually perform a cross product? So we've shown it's C of A cross B, but what does that actually mean and how do we actually perform the operations just to, to find our, our uh, solution? So uh, let's you know, start uh, with Cartesian vector form, uh, one of, which is one of the solutions or uh, methods to solve the cross product. So we know our unit uh, direction uh, uh, indices or, or vectors uh, i, j, and k and these describe the the directions of x, y, and z. 
um, uh, along these uh, along the X Y Z axes. Um, so let's go ahead and look at uh, the equation. Let's repeat the equation that we produced earlier for the C uh, car for the Cartesian form of C. So the C vector is equal to a vector cross b vector, which is also equal to a magnitude times b magnitude times sine of theta, uh, the unit direction vector of vector c. So uh, let's assume that we were to do the cross product of a unit direction vector i and a, uh, and a unit direction vector j. So it's the direction i as a vector and a direction j as a full vector. If we were to perform that, then if we were to take the magnitudes of A, which is 1, a magnitude of, of B, which is 1, and then we would try to you know, do the sine of the angle that is between I and J. Well, the angle between I and J is 90 degrees, and so it's sine of 90 degrees, uh, times K, where that is a unit direction vector C, which would be the perpendicular plane, we find that I cross J is equal to K. If we were to do the opposite, well, if, if we were to uh, switch positions and say that J cross I, then we would produce magnitudes 1 times 1 times sine of negative 90 degrees uh, times uh, unit direction K. And so we find that J cross I is equal to negative K. Now let's look at if... Um, now let's look at if we had uh, two unit direction vectors that were identical, so i cross i. Well, if we did i cross i, then we'd have 1 times 1 times the sine of 0, because there's no angle between those vectors because they're in the, in the identical direction, times k. And we'll find that i cross i is equal to 0. So you know we perform these operations, and we find that there's certain behavior that we find if we're using unit direction vectors. Now let's go ahead and fully exercise this and do the cross product of all the combinations of unit direction vectors. When we do that, we'll find that, uh, that the identical uh, unit direction vectors i, i, j, j, k, k go to zero, and the remaining terms will produce certain values, whether they're positive or negative, depending on uh, the, the, which uh, unit direction vector is chosen first and cross product by the other. So now that we've done this and we've identified uh, these uh, relationships between the unit direction vectors uh, being cross product by each other, let's go ahead and attempt a cross product of some vector A uh, and vector B, where vector A has components AXI plus AYJ plus AZK, and vector B has BXI plus BYJ plus BZK, okay? So if we were to perform this cross product, we would go ahead and uh, do the multiplication uh, and, and, uh, um, and take the, the like terms and put them together uh, naturally. And from that, we would get uh, the following relationships, where it's uh, AX, BX, I cross I, and AX, BY, I cross J. We produce numerous terms. And we would find that uh, some of these terms let me use a color that we're not using currently. These terms here would go to zero, and several of the terms would become negative values. And so once we've taken this full, fully exercised, fully uh, uh, algebraically exercised problem, and we simplify it, we'll find that the cross product of A cross B is equal to the following simplified relationship, where it is AY times BZ minus AZ times BY uh, in brackets I minus AX BZ minus AZ BZ in brackets J plus brackets AX BY minus AY BX bracket K. And this is the, the, the closed solution on how to find the cross product of A cross B. And you can see that you know, if you look at the amount of steps that are required in order to do the cross product using just the Cartesian form and just basic algebraic uh, manipulation, 
or well, algebraic exercise, we find that it's pretty hard to get this closed form solution. Um, so it's probably better for us to use a different approach. To me, the preferred approach for finding the cross product of uh, two vectors is to use the determinant form, which is to find which is to to you know find a determinant of, of the vector a cross b. And this approach is a little bit graphical. It takes a little bit of uh, thought to to pick up, but once you're used to it and you've done it a couple of times and you're familiar with just the slight tricks in it, it can be very useful. Um, so let's go ahead and start. So a vector a cross b is equal to this determinant form where we have i, j, k, ax, ay, az, bx, by, and bz within brackets. And we want to perform the determinant. So the first thing that we want to do is find the component uh, for element i. So what we want to do is we want to take this diagram and we want to identify the components for, for i. So let's circle i. Let's remove the uh, the let's remove the column and the row through which i uh, cuts through, and then let's go ahead and uh, graphically produce the i component. So we circle i. We can put i here. We cross out the row and the column, and then we. We can start with the multiplication of the upper left times the lower right component, which is ay, bz, and we subtract it minus the, uh, the upper right to the lower left component, which is az and by. And we've produced the i element uh, of the determinant for this problem. Okay? So it can be very tricky to figure out, uh, but just always remember the upper left to the lower right, the upper right to the lower left. And you can produce uh, the, the I component. Now in, in this diagram, they suggest just drawing this interesting type shape, this half of, a, a, of an infinite loop, you can do that as well, or whatever method works for you. But I just always remember the upper left, lower right, upper right, lower left. I just like to, to do it like that, OK? Now, the trick for um, finding the determinant is all in the J element. In the J element, we circle J. We get rid of the column and the row through which J that, that element comes through. And we have to remember for element j that we must put a negative sign. We must always put a negative sign in front of j before we do anything else. Okay? Now once we've done that, then we can use the same approach, upper left, lower right, which is ax, bz, minus the upper right, lower left, which is az, bx. Okay? And that's pretty much the only tricky part. Uh, for element k, we go back and we, we, we do the same thing that we did for element i, uh, which is, is assume it's a positive value. So let's circle k, get rid of the row and the column. Let's write k. And let's go ahead and do the same process. ax, by, minus ay, bx creating that X pattern. Um, and so we've basically identified each of the components, the I, the J, and the K component of the uh, cross product between A cross B. And now that we've found these individual components, all we have to do is simply add them together. And when we add them together, we produce, well, when we, we add them together, we produce our closed form solution to the cross product. Now, some of you will be tempted to just take this closed form solution, put it on your formula sheet, and just use it that way without actually performing the determinant. 
um, I suggest that you actually perform the determinant. Um, you're going to use a determinant significant, you know, a lot more times in the future in classes such as uh, uh, vibrations and, and, and problems of dynamics uh, and a number of different problems in the future. So it's important that you know how to actually perform a determinant. Um, also, sometimes you'll have components, say, you, it, it, like, Sometimes your components, A, X, A, Y, A, Z, those magnitudes will have negative values. And when you have those negative values, sometimes it can be tricky to use this closed form solution uh, and, and produce the appropriate uh, uh, answer. So I would say that what you should do is take significant time and just practice uh, performing determinants. Uh, many calculators nowadays can perform determinants. So what you could do is you could create fictitious vectors. So make up a fake vector A, a fake vector B. Try to do the determinant yourself. And then put it in your calculator and see if your determinant is correct and compared to your calculator solution. Um, or you can use some of the numerical codes like MathCAD or Mathematica. Whatever that you've downloaded uh, through ETC, through the, uh, the Engineering Technical Center, um, you can you know, use to help you really learn how to find a determinant. Um, so with that being said, here is an example that you can work on uh, right after this video. And we can call this a pop quiz, which is find the cross product of vector A cross B where vector A is 1i plus 2j plus 3k, and vector B is 9i plus 8j plus 7k. So um, pause this video, attempt to do the cross product. Um, you can rewind if you need a little help on the, the steps in terms of the determinant, uh, and then um, unpause and, and you'll have your solution okay so pause right now so you know now that you've solved it for yourself let me go ahead and show you the answer um, so what we do here is a cross b we create our determinant where we have our brackets we have i j k let me clean this up a little bit we have i j k we have uh, one two three we have 987, which corresponds to the x, y, and z components for vector A and vector B, right? So we want to do our cross product. We circle I, we cross out our rows. What do we get? We get 2 times 7 minus 3 times 8, right? And that's what we produce in terms of our I component. Now that we've done that, let's go ahead and produce our J component. We circle J and we get rid of the row and the column and, and then we perform the calculation. 1 times 7 minus 3 times 9. And we have to remember that with the J component we must put a negative sign. So we have negative 1 times 7 minus 3 times 9. Now we can do the last component which is K. We circle K, we get rid of the row and the column and then we perform the calculation. So it's 1 times 8 minus 2 times 9 uh, is equal to k. And now that we've done that, we've produced our R, i, j, and k components. We simply perform the multiplication and find our simplified answer, which is negative 10j plus 2, oh, wait, wait, sorry, negative 10i plus 2j minus 10k. That should be the answer for this cross product. Um, so today we've learned what a moment is, uh, uh, what the equation for the magnitude of a moment is, what its direction is, and we've also learned about cross products. Uh, in the next section we're going to learn how we can use cross products to determine the moment of a 3D uh, the 3D moments of of uh, of a force of a 3D force vector. Um, so now that we've gone over this material, you should read chapters one and two. Be prepared for a quiz in class on this material, um, and uh, you know, have a good day.
I'm Dr. Stewart. Thank you for watching this video.